Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Mode and today on Hot Mode we are going to be getting into the 2024 Met Gala theme because I know that you're probably as confused as I am. 2024 Met Gala theme this year has been announced as the Garden of Time and in today's video we're going to be breaking down what that actually means, how that will tie in with the Costume Institute's exhibition, and why I expect we'll be seeing a lot of Disney princess cosplay. And with co-hosts like Zendaya, Bad Bunny, Jennifer Lopez, and Chris Hemsworth, there's no doubt some fashion moments are expected. But in order for that to happen, and for us as the audience to truly be able to discern whether or not the celebrities on the red carpet actually hit their marks, we gotta do a fashion deep dive. So let's not waste any more time and get into it so you're all prepared for Monday, May 6, 2024. So let's first get one thing clear. The Met Gala theme is the Garden of Time, which is entirely different from the theme of the exhibit for the Costume Institute, which is titled Sleeping Beauty's Reawakening Fashion. I know people think that the Met Gala is vapid, but it is a fundraiser whose goal is to raise funds for the continuation of the Costume Institute so it can care for and curate exhibits about the history of fashion because the Met actually doesn't give the Costume Institute any money. And the exhibits can be viewed by anybody when they're in New York and they go to the Met. So not only will the Met Gala be the big publicity push for the spring exhibit, but the fundraising also benefits the fall exhibitions every year, with the most recent being Women Dressing Women, which looked at some of the greatest women designers throughout history who oftentimes don't get the acclaim, praise, or importance placed on their work as the unsung heroes of fashion and style. So now before we talk about the dress code for the evening of the Met Gala, we have to talk about the exhibition theme as that gives us a lot more context about the reason the dress code theme for the evening was chosen. Again, Sleeping Beauty's reawakening fashion might automatically make people think of Disney princesses like Sleeping Beauty who pricks her finger on a spinning wheel and is cursed to fall asleep for a hundred years and can only be awoken by true love's kiss. And while the story of Sleeping Beauty might have been an influence, don't expect any Disney costumes in the exhibit for your own sake. The exhibit will focus on a more niche element of fashion, which is the care and storing of garments so that they can remain in conditions that allow them to exist still and be used for historical references. The Costume Institute's main goal when it was founded in 1937, not in conjunction with the Met at that point, was to preserve fashion's history, and did that by conserving fashion and costume pieces from time. It combined with the Met Museum in 1946 and has continued on since then amassing an exquisite private collection through both donations and acquisitions of key garments. A large part of the Costume Institute's job isn't just putting clothing on mannequins and calling it a day. Rather, to upkeep a range of pieces that date back from all the way to 2300 BCE till today. And with the collection of 33,000 pieces, that is a lot of dry cleaning people. Now, the idea of the exhibit will be about pulling out some of the most delicate pieces from the Costume Institute's collections and putting them on display, which maybe doesn't sound super important or exhilarating, but it shows to the world the importance of clothing conservation and how difficult it can be. Think of each of the conservators at the Costume Institute as their own dry cleaner, each one. Now, I think a great modern example of why featuring these sleeping beauties for a prolonged period outside of their carefully conditioned storage boxes and spaces is so meaningful can be seen through the lens of Kim Kardashian's controversial wearing of Marilyn Monroe's famous naked dress by Jean-Louis. To attend the 2022 Met Gala, as I'm sure you all remember, Kim Kardashian emerged on the Met steps wearing a sheer crystal encrusted dress that was originally worn by Marilyn Monroe back in 1962 when she performed the iconic but siren-like Happy Birthday song to the then president John F. Kennedy, whom many speculate she was also having an affair with. Now, I would say that not only is the dress itself a historical artifact because of Marilyn's wearing it and pushing boundaries of what revealing clothing could be, but because it holds significance in the cultural, political, and societal landscape of the United States. But my issue here is historical artifacts like this shouldn't be used as props for publicity stunts, which is what the garment became when Kardashian attempted to fit into the dress, which she actually couldn't, and is the reason she wore a white fur jacket around her elbows to hide the fact that it did not fit in the back. Now, the for-profit museum, Ripley's Believe It or Not, was the owner of the dress, which they bought at auction for $4.8 million, making it the most expensive dress ever sold in the world. They then lent it to Kardashian to wear, but post the Met Gala, photos emerged that irreversible damage had been done to the dress because of Kardashian's wearing of it. There was an outcry from the fashion conservation world, and even Bob Mackie, who actually was the creator of the dress physicality-wise, condemned the wearing of it. And here's the thing, and the big point of the exhibit overall. 
Fabric and clothing after time is sensitive to so many elements that most of the time they should never be worn again to keep them in that proper original condition. Now I won't say that Kim Kardashian is the inspiration for this exhibit or that Andrew Bolton, who is the curator of the Costume Institute, has a vendetta against her and is doing this to spite her. Although, that would make me laugh. I can't imagine Andrew Bolton being petty, but like, would I love to see that? 1 million percent, yes. But Kim Kardashian's use of Marilyn's dress seems like a perfect point to address the importance of textile and fashion conservation, which is often not seen as important compared to other art conservancies. I mean, the response to Kim wearing the dress was very supportive by a lot of people. Whereas if Kim Kardashian said, you know what, I'm just gonna do a little paint over of the Mona Lisa, people wouldn't be as happy. Listen, just because Kardashian wore the dress does not mean automatically that it increased the value of it. Because the value of a garment doesn't only come from who had worn it in the past, but the condition of the garment as well. And clothing as time goes on becomes very, very sensitive to outside elements. And that's why oftentimes when you go to museums and see their collections, there aren't often pieces dating back further than the 15th or 16th centuries, or at least ones that are pretty intact. That's because throughout most of human history, clothing and textiles have always been made of natural fibers. Unlike clay or stones or the modern polyesters and rayons, fibers like wools, linens, cotton, silks, and more textiles will degrade over time unless sealed in very good conditions. The oldest remnants of non-animal textiles date back to about 34,000 years ago and were not discovered in any form of intact clothing, but rather fibers found in clay on the ground of a cave in the Republic of Georgia. The fibers were actually pieces of flax, which is a plant that can be turned into linen, which were used as threads that sewed together animal skins that would have been worn by early humans. This is opposed to articles like jewelry or vases or pots, which remain in similar archeological sites somewhat or usually fully intact. The only remnants of these clothes are microscopic fibers of their threads that they found accidentally when they were examining the clay. And this goes back to the importance of clothing conservation, as clothing and textiles made up of natural fibers usually cannot remain intact for such long periods of time after their initial creation. In the case of some textiles, like the ceremonial and ritual linen that wrapped the body of the pharaoh King Tutankhamun, which initially were white when he was wrapped, over the millennia they turned a black color similar to soot. The burial grounds and tombs of pharaohs, especially in Egypt, would have been better kept and preserved than the average or even nobility of ancient Egypt, as well as the conditions of Egypt is kind of dry and good for just preserving things anyway. Textiles degrading in quality is incredibly difficult to negate outside of today's very modern standards and practices. Now you might be wondering, if Tutankhamun had his tomb sealed, what could have caused the degrading of the textiles? Well, a lot of things, because textiles have a host of enemies. Some of the more obvious ones might be insects or animals like moths or mice that can and will feast on these fibers, but things like lighting, moisture levels, air quality, dusts, and molds are all factors that most people probably don't think about and sometimes can't even see. And that's why the theme of Sleeping Beauty's reawakening fashion begins to make more sense as we see it in the context of pieces that are usually hidden from public view and they return to being seen in a wider context, but for a limited time. I want to talk a little bit more about the hurdles of clothing conservation as it's important to understand why it's so difficult to keep these pieces intact. So for those that might have ever been to a fashion exhibit, you might have noticed that the lighting is usually very dark. And for those who might have never been, one of the earliest videos on this channel is actually of the 2015 Costume Institute exhibit, China Through the Looking Glass. And we can see that entering the Met lobby in the main hall itself is quite light. But once we move into the Costume Institute exhibit, it gets really, really dark. The issue with light is UV will break down clothing's molecules. And with repeated exposure and exposure over time, the breaking down of the molecules from the UV is going to happen and it cannot be mended. Like the actual molecules themselves, you can't fix them. They're just so small and so tiny it would be impossible. Next, we have to think about moisture damage. When I started collecting clothing, I didn't realize that moisture levels were incredibly important to the clothing conservation process because too little or too much moisture in the air can either oversaturate the garments and lead to molds and mildews, while too little moisture can cause dry rotting of the garments because the moisture of the natural material is being wicked away in too high a volume and it can corrode the fibers. Leather can easily dry rot, which is essentially where the leather begins to crack and chip off like flakes of paint, while fur 
fur will begin to split and tear through on the linings. This is also the reason that many people who own furs historically have placed them in cold storage during warmer months because they would be kept at ideal temperatures and moisture levels. When looking at moisture control to store all kinds of clothing, the temperature is usually between 60 and 75 degrees, while between 30 to 60 RH or relative humidity levels is the perfect moisture temperature or atmosphere. The thing is, textiles are hygroscopic, which means they are able to absorb and hold moisture from the air inside of them. If the moisture levels are not stable, the fibers in the textile will expand and shrink, with expanding happening when there is a higher moisture content and shrinking happening with lower moisture content. And scary to think about, there are always mold spores in the air. There's no getting around that. But when there is a higher moisture content that is absorbed in the textile, the mold spores have a chance to take hold and begin to eat away at the garments. Now, air quality also has to be considered, as if the air quality is poor or things like smoke are present, those particles can become attached and eventually degrade the garments over time as well. And another huge reason why this exhibit is so big is because we will all get to see all these clothes up close. Now, that might seem pretty obvious, and considering I'm making a video about it, you might all say, Luke, I'm not that stupid. I get it. We're going to see clothes up close and personal. But the thing we probably don't think about is that we are factors that can corrode these garments without even knowing it. We as humans breathe. We have sweat and we have little moisture of our own. And we shed, whether that is hair or skin that sometimes is visible and other times is not. Those pieces of dander or those pieces of sweat can fall or attach themselves to the clothes or can fall on the floor, contribute to the creation of dust, and both can attract insects that feed on dander and our gross humanness. The dander-eating insects can attract insects that eat the dander-eating insects, creating a food chain that can cause an infestation on the garments as well. And some animals are just attracted to the natural fibers in clothing like moths, or worse, Cockroaches. I didn't know that. I found that out when I googled. Disgusting. Disgraciad. No bueno. And now the reason that I won't shut up about the exhibit and the importance of all these conditions is because when we think about Kim Kardashian's wearing of the Marilyn Monroe Jean-Louis dress, sweat and hair and dander and things like that placed on the archival garment can also corrode those fibers over time as well as change the color or even stretch the weaves of the actual garment. You know, the things that you can't really see, but if you were to pull, you'd kind of pull it all out. Wearing archival clothing that is really important and should be preserved is bad. And also, getting to see these pieces up close and personal is kind of a privilege. It's something that you don't really get to see often because otherwise they could be damaged in the process. And that's why this is kind of cool. I think we can agree that there is a lot more than meets the eye when it comes to conserving clothing. And it's a trade that should be respected the same way art conservation is. And while for many, they may not know people that collect vintage Chanel's or 16th century sleeves, they might know someone who collects war memorabilia that includes military uniforms or patches, costumes from TV or movies, or even people who still have their grandmother or even mother's wedding dress that needs to be stored properly. This idea of textile conservation is important to see and realize that we all have the capability to do it. And it's something that is a science. Even if people only want to believe it's a vapid hoarding of clothing. Sometimes in my case, it might be that the latter, but still. And now if you've sat through my ramblings, we're at the important part, which is the theme of the actual Met Gala evening. And now let's get into the part that you've all been waiting for, which is the actual theme of the Met Gala evening, the Garden of Time. This is the dress code for the theme of the Met Gala itself. It's not to be confused with Sleeping Beauty's Reawakened Fashion, although that is part of the influence on this whole theme. The Garden of Time seems a tad bit open-ended as per usual, but is actually based on a short story by the British author J.G. Ballard. Now, Ballard is famous for his novel Empire of the Sun about a British boy living in Shanghai when the Japanese Imperial Army takes over, which was then later turned into a film with the same name. But the Garden of Time's a little bit different, and let's do a synopsis. Now, the story follows a count and a countess who live in a large villa in the countryside with beautiful gardens and rolling hills and fields. Now, they are both dressed impeccably, seemingly in late 19th century dress and are cultured and obviously wealthy. But every day from the safety of their villa balcony, they can see a ragged army of quote humanity approaching their home slowly but surely. We're not really sure of the intentions of the army, but the count each evening as the horde grows closer plucks this beautiful little flower made of crystal from the garden, which pushes the horde back as it envelops and 
explodes. It's not really a gust of wind or a group of soldiers that moves that horde back, but it's almost like they reset back where they were from earlier. And that's when we discovered that these crystal flowers actually reverse space and time, a bit like the remote from the Adam Sandler movie Click. But the issue for the Count and Countess is that there are only a few of their crystal flowers left in the garden, and over the days, they begin to run out. The final day, the Count and Countess act as if nothing is happening and clean and organize their grand estate, but as night approaches, they come together to use the last crystal flower that glimmers and shines and pushes the horde back just a little bit. But as the horde begins again and successfully breaks through the garden's walls and begins its descent onto the villa itself, two figures from inside a very high thorned bush look out over the garden. Stone figures that look exactly like the Count and Countess in their full outfits seem untouched by both natural elements like wind and rain, but also the horde because of the thorns that create a barrier. And well, the story ends with a look at a single rose with delicate petals that for only a moment blends in with the stone of the figures. Now, to be honest, upon first reading the story, I thought, didn't we just like do the Gilded Age thing? You know, we had that dress code that looked like, you know, the culture and fashion history of the haves and have nots. Yeah, we did. But then I realized the use of the story as inspiration more than likely has to do with the idea of repelling time, just as fashion conservators want to repel the elements that eventually corrode garments, which time is only one factor of. And it seems that even with a magical flower with properties that can reverse time, there is still only so much that can be done to prevent what is inevitable. But does this story really help us narrow down what exactly will be on display on the Met step? To a degree, maybe. Listen, Vogue, who helped come up with the theme, stated that, quote, fleeting beauty is a boiled down way of interpreting the theme. And I think we will more than likely see a lot of florals and time or clock themed styles. Bit on the nose for me, but heck. I also have a feeling that we will see a lot of references from designers both into their own archive and into historical fashions and fashion moments. And I say this because I think both the exhibit and the dress code theme have been inspired not just by fashion conservation, but the general theme in the past decade or so of secondhand vintage and archival fashion becoming not only a trend, but part of the normal wardrobe of many young and old people. Fashion has always been about pushing forward what is the next trend and style must have, from Charles Frederick Worth to today. But it has also almost always been about referencing the past and modernizing it and then selling it to people as the new thing, making this idea of buying archival and vintage secondhand clothing kind of passe and not chic. I mean, listen, designers like Charles James and later Cristobal Balenciaga and Christian Dior all referenced clothes from the 18th century as inspiration, while Madeleine Vianney took standard clothing lining construction to create the bias cut technique, which then became the medium that John Galliano and Alexander McQueen both continued to perfect. This idea of fashion being cyclical and trying to sell the old as the new has always been there. There are even the great fashion family trees like Christian Dior, who employed Pierre Cardin, who employed Jean-Paul Gaultier, who employed Margiela, who then inspired Ralph Simmons, who employed both Peter Moulier and Mathieu Blasé. These designers reference the work of their fashion grandparents and parents, and it continues the cycle of designers being inspired or learning from each other, again, making the old new. In this year's context, we should think of fashion history like a gigantic garden, where one can pick the easiest and most convenient flowers that always look beautiful no matter where they are, or you can get lost in the weeds and find beauty in garments that might have been written off or forgotten about and turn those into something worthy of becoming immortalized. To go back to this general trend as of recent years where vintage clothing has become a way to break into the fashion world when access by its gatekeepers isn't always granted, I mean, listen, Kim Kardashian wearing the Marilyn Monroe dress is an example, but her also wearing the famous Alexander McQueen oyster dress or a slew of vintage Thierry Mugler creations also bolster the fact that Kardashian used an extensive network of vintage fashion dealers to secure herself as someone with fashion history knowledge. But I personally think this idea of vintage fashion becoming cool within the fashion world per se was when Anya Taylor-Joy wore a vintage Bob Mackie wedding dress back in February of 2020 for one of the Emma premieres. The use of a beautiful vintage inspired gown that came from stylist Law Roach's own personal archive, which he had won at auction, was kind of unheard of. 
The unconventionality of the style, but also that it was vintage, made its way around the internet in a manner that had never really been seen. With the rise of social media, especially when fashion flourished in its early days on Tumblr or forums or Instagram, this idea of vintage and archival imagery became widely available for consumption and began to train the eyes of young and old people that enjoyed the craft. It taught people the history of legendary and forgotten fashion houses and showcased iconic fashion moments which brought with it a nostalgia for an era in fashion that was long gone by the mid-2010s. But brands in the past four years or so have become more and more open to recreating past designs like Prada and Hunter Schaefer or the Junon and Venus dresses on Natalie Portman and Anya Taylor-Joy. And in some cases, letting certain celebrities pull actual archival pieces from their collections have become kind of the norm, like Zendaya wearing the fembot suit from Thierry Mugler, which Mugler allowed, which was a smart move as it went viral and allowed a lot of people to open up their ideas to Mugler as a brand, even if it was to just make fart jokes. This idea of old clothing coming back also happened really recently when Balenciaga made a gown for Michelle Yeoh at the Oscars, which was made up of three or four non-Balenciaga haute couture dresses bought secondhand off of eBay, upcycling these vintage garments into something completely new. The thing is, the Garden of Time is before us in the current cultural fashion zeitgeist. This idea of remembering these pieces or remixing them like exploding flowers is happening already. And so I wonder if Andrew Bolton and Anna Wintour are using the Met this year to reflect this years long trend of vintage garments becoming not only cool when it comes to museum mannequins, but cool when worn by people as well. This year's Met Gal theme, pretty open-ended. And that means a lot of people will do the bare minimum, but I have a lot of faith celebrities will really work to make their outfits this year truly something special. But to be honest, I guess we won't know what the Garden of Time really holds till May 6, where I'll be covering all of the looks for all of you. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope this gave you a little bit more understanding of what the vibe will be for the Met Gala. And I will see you guys on the next video. So TTYL.